Pedro, we're live. Okay, thank you. Sergeant, would you please start your recordings? PC recording is underway. Cloud recording is up. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's hearing. I am Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer, Chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. Today, we're considering three very important pieces of legislation aimed at addressing some incredibly timely and important issues uh, surrounding our city, our nation, and indeed our, our world. Uh, introduction number 2203, uh, uh, which I'm proud to sponsor, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about later, uh, establishes uh, the first ever Drag Laureate program. And I'm thrilled we have some folks here today to talk about how important uh, this would be. Resolution 1487, sponsored by public advocate Jumani Williams, is going to be heard today, and that's in relation to recognizing November 20th annually as Transgender Day of Remembrance and March 31st annually as Transgender Day of Visibility in the city of New York. Public Advocate Williams is with us and will be speaking momentarily about these important uh, issues. Also, we're gonna to hear today resolution uh, 1543 sponsored by my colleague, council member Diana Ayala, in relation to calling on Congress to pass and the president to sign the Puerto Rico Self-Determination Act of 2020, HR 8113. And I'm uh, very pleased that council member Ayala is here and will be speaking momentarily about this very important uh, resolution. So speaking of my bill, intro 2203, which would establish a new drag laureate program. Annually, the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs in collaboration with the Director of the Office of Nightlife would choose a drag laureate to act as an ambassador to local businesses and LGBTQ spaces and promote arts and culture in the city in a way that just hasn't been done. Similar in cultural uh, significance to that of a poet laureate and the pair artist in residence program, the drag laureate would serve to champion and highlight the contributions of the drag community in New York City's business, arts, and cultural spaces and amplify the impacts of New York's LGBTQ plus community. I'm thrilled that we have some uh, legendary uh, activists, drag queens, and uh, rock stars in our city who are testifying uh, momentarily on this uh, bill. Uh, but I want uh, uh, to let my colleagues uh, say a few words about their very important uh, pieces of legislation. Again, thrilled that the public advocate, uh, our public advocate, Jumani Williams, and uh, Council Member Ayala have put forward uh, these important pieces of legislation. Uh, but uh, needless to say, uh, the Transgender Day of Remembrance and Transgender Day of Visibility in New York City, incredibly important. Uh, we know we are still uh, losing uh, uh, so many uh, to violence. Um, uh, and we need, of course, uh, to demonstrate uh, every day how wrong that is and that it has to end. But also we need to celebrate uh, the trans community uh, in ways that are joyful and uh, Jumani Williams will speak to that in a moment. And of course, uh, New York has a very, very special relationship uh, with Puerto Rico and uh, thrilled that uh, our colleague, uh, Council Member Ayala has um, uh, brought this forward so we can speak about uh, this important issue today. 
uh, all three bills uh, move these conversations forward, but hopefully also move them forward to passage uh, before the end of this year and emphasize the importance of embracing uh, and understanding the critical roles that our identities, backgrounds, and heritage uh, play in making New York City uh, what I believe is the greatest city in the world. I want to thank uh, the administration for being here today. We look forward to speaking with Commissioner Gonzalo Casals uh, in a moment after we hear from our public advocate and council member Ayala. And I want to thank the community members and advocates who have joined us today and want them to know we are grateful for your partnership. Finally, I want to thank uh, my staff, Legislative Director Jack Bernadovitz, my Chief of Staff Matt Wallace, and our committee staff, our committee counsel, Brenda McKinney, our legislative policy analyst, Christy Dwyer, our principal financial analyst, Alia Ali. Uh, and now I would like to invite public advocate, Jumani Williams, uh, to speak to his important resolution. Peace and blessings. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Jumani Williams. I'm the public advocate of the city of New York. Uh, I want to thank again Chairperson Ben Bramer and the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations for holding this hearing on these three significant bills. I'm proud, as was mentioned, to sponsor Reso 1487, recognizing November 30th and March 31st, respectively, as Transgender Day of Remembrance and Visibility in the City of New York. This resolution has been the collaborative effort and work of our partners at the Office of the Public Advocate who consistently work with us to engage in every way we can to address the plight of transgender New Yorkers experience. This resolution is a symbolic request, but must be followed by a continued commitment from all of our elected officials to advocate for the trans community, particularly as we've seen the enactment and introduction of some of the most anti-trans legislation in our nation's history. In 1999, trans advocate Gwendolyn Ann Smith organized a vigil, a vigil to honor the memory of Rita Hester, a black trans woman in Boston, now remembered as an ebullient, glamorous person following her violent and unsolved murder on November 28, 1998. Over two decades later, what we now know as Trans Day, Transgender Day of Remembrance, or TDOR, annually gives name and history to the many transgender people worldwide who have similarly and tragically been murdered or died. Every year on November 20, organizations and organizers across the city gather to remember the lives of those who have been lost each year. Each year remains a reminder that we all have to collectively work to seriously redress, address the unique and violent experiences of transgender and gender non-conforming New Yorkers. We cannot say enough that without the leadership and organizing of so many trans people, the civil rights of all our communities would not be where we are now. Yet in response to the lacking positive recognition of this impact, Trans activist Rachel Crandall launched International Trans Day of Visibility. Now more than ever, increased visibility and organizing for trans lives remains crucial to addressing the discrimination and systemic issues TDOV raises awareness of. Earlier this year, President Biden followed suit in recognizing TDOV. While this is an opportunity to do so in New York, this resolution, again, must be accompanied by continued collaboration with our trans New Yorkers to achieve equitable housing workforce development and education opportunities and safety in the city. I'll be the first to say that neither our partners or myself are satisfied with the work here and believe our commitment must follow the passage of this, re this resolution accordingly. Recognize the violence trans New Yorkers experience means we must commit to ending them. Uplifting the work and impact of trans New Yorkers means we must commit to expanding opportunities for the work and impact to be greater. We in New York have led the country in legal rights and services for transgender New Yorkers but this should not invite complacency in our roles as leaders to find and address gaps in our duties. Thank you to all the members of the Black Trans Women Roundtable here at the Office of Public Advocate and our partners who constantly, who constantly show us what it means to support and uplift New York's transgender, gender, non-conforming and non-binary community. Thank you again, Chair Van Bremer and the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries and International Intergroup Relations for your time and equal commitment to creating a safer and more uplifting New York for transgender and gender non-conforming people grateful to sponsor this resolution, even more excited for the positive change to come. Thank you for holding this hearing uh, at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Public Advocate Williams, for your leadership and bringing this forward. And I do want to recognize our members of the committee who have joined us, uh, Council Members Mark Jonai and Council Member Dharma Diaz are with us, and we will announce others as they arrive. Um, 
Council member Diana Ayala, would you like to speak to resolution 1543? Yes, thank you. Good morning. Um, and thank you, Chair Ben Bramer, for hearing this resolution today. Uh, resolution 1543 calls on Congress to pass and the president to sign the Puerto Rico Self-Determination Act of 2021, HR 2070, originally introduced in 2020 as HR 8113 and co-sponsored by Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez and Congresswoman uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. HR 2070 recognizes the right of the, Puerto, of the people of Puerto Rico to call a status convention through which the people would exercise their natural right to self-determination and to establish a, mac a mechanism for congressional consideration of such decision. This bill establishes a process for the people of Puerto Rico to vote on the political status of the territory. For too long, Puerto Ricans have been exposed to policies that were not in the best interest of their well-being. The reality is, uh, the realities of this neglect have affected every aspect of Puerto Rican lives, economically, politically, and environmentally. The Self-Determination Act would allow Puerto Ricans the option to chart a course uh, to change the destructive uh, effects of colonization and allow for New York new leadership to oversee the process of decolonization. Puerto Rico faces a myriad of challenges, economic devastation, government mismanagement, and dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. Add to this the agony of dealing with the current pandemic, which has caused additional loss of life and distress of over 2,000 families. Inadequate assistance from the federal government and the inability for Puerto Rico to file for bankruptcy further exacerbates the fiscal crisis and limits the tools it has to restore the healthy uh, economy. A path to a healthy and thriving econ uh, economy should start with the voices of its residents. Now is the time to politically empower Puerto Ricans for their voices to be heard and to be granted the opportunity to decide their path and vision for the future. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member Ayala. And uh, before I hand it over to our council to administer the oath, I wanna thank Commissioner Casals uh, for being here. Uh, and for his uh, leadership in our city, both our cultural sector um, and also uh, our LGBTQ um, community of which he is a proud member. Uh, so with that, I will hand it over to our council. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Chair Bramer, Dan Bramer. I'm Christy Dwyer, Legislative Policy Analyst to the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries and International Intergroup Relations of the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling pa panelists to testify. Before we begin, I wanna remind everyone that you'll be on mute until I call you to testify. And after you are called upon, you will be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name as I will periodically announce who the next panelist will be. Council member questions will be limited to five minutes and council members, please note that this includes both your answers your questions and the witnesses' answers. And please note that we will not allow a second round of questions at today's hearing. For public testimony, I will call up individuals and panels. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. You will be called on after everyone on that panel has completed their testimony. For public panelists, once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin speaking after setting the timer. All public testimony will be limited to two minutes. And after I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the sergeant at arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Today, we're happy to have with us Gonzalo Casals, commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs. I will deliver the oath to you, and after, I will call on you to respond to the oath. Please raise your right hand, Commissioner. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you, Commissioner. You may begin your testimony when ready. Um, first of all, I want to apologize, uh, Chair Van Bremer. I know that you had an expectation of me showing up in drag this morning. I couldn't get um, my outfit together for the hearing. Apologies for that. Good morning, Chair Van Bremer. I'm Gonzalo Casals, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, here today to testify in regards to intro 2203 of 2021. 
the establishment of a drug laureate program for New York City. I'm in support of any effort to elevate and highlight the art forms rooted in marginalized communities. Drag has a rich and at times rocky history in New York City. It's provided a space for people to connect with who were not welcome in largest, large swaths of society. Even as drag is increasingly embraced by the mainstream, it is one of the few places that queer people can be unapologetically extra. But if it's also been a source of stigma and persecution by authorities. So I'm overjoyed by the idea of it being embraced and supported by our local government. DCLA supports a number of organizations who work in the drag space, such as the Drag Queen Story Hour, Le Ballet Trocadero, the Monte Carlo, and spaces like House of Yes and Dixon Place. With the Village Halloween Parade making a triumphant return in just a few days, we'll see the glorious energy of the drag scene in full display. We need to be cautious not to conflate the drag scene with our LGBTQ community. We have come a long way in recent decades to recognizing the full breadth of our trans community, which was once referred to as drag by a mainstream looking to dismiss trans people. And true drag is often dominated by cisgender men. I've been excited to see these barriers broken down in recent years, and any laureate program would need to reflect the increasingly inclusive and equitable definition of the art form. One that embraces trans people, people of color, people with disabilities, all ages and every background. Nothing more empowering than seeing yourself reflected in society. Elevating this art form will help New Yorkers think about gender in and breaking down rigid binaries. That's why I'm delighted and excited by the prospect of New York having a drag laureate and hope that it marks the start of additional ways for our city to embrace and elevate art forms by and for marginalized communities. I look forward to working with you toward a drag laureate program benefiting our city. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much, uh, Casal, uh, Commissioner Casals, uh, for uh, your testimony here today and uh, your support, of course, of establishing a drag laureate program. Uh, appreciate uh, you being here. And, um, you know, I think that there are some folks who wonder about the importance and the significance of of such a program. And uh, of course, there are so many important issues that we're all faced with in our, our society. And we are rightfully focused on, on justice and, and equity. Maybe you can speak uh, a little bit more. You, you certainly highlighted a, a bit in your testimony, but to anyone who might be saying like, why is the city council taking this up? Why is this important? Uh, and, uh, and how might it actually be transformational? I think it's important, I wanna highlight it. Uh, I mentioned it many times in my testimony. First of all, um, we should consider it as an art form, right? And usually the art, the art forms that have been created by marginal, marginalized groups are sometimes not taken seriously, right? They're not high art, low art, you name it. Um, but second of all, like any, uh, any art form, any cultural experience, um, the minute that you see society reflecting who you are, reflecting your experiences, reflecting you know, how you feel, um, you get this uh, incredibly empowering feeling that you uh, matter, that you exist, and that you are part of a larger community. The most, most effective way to um, alienate a, a, a person, a whole community, is by denying the reflection in society. And that has been happening with many marginalized groups, including you know, the LGBTQ community. And within the LGBT community, um, those are breaking the uh, gender binary. Um, again, I don't wanna conflate you know, the art form with the uh, gender identity, but uh, um, it is a way to start showing newer generations that uh, you know the gender binary is not um, as um, strict, uh, and it could be um, um, broken down. And how do you see it being helpful in terms of uh, amplifying support for uh, the LGBTQ and uh, and other uh, uh, sectors, uh, the the business sector, bars, restaurants, clubs, nightlife, um, and and how there's an ecosystem there that this this position could be an, an important part of. 
as you mentioned on in your intro, we have seen over and over again how arts and culture can be an engine for economic development, could be a way to um, not only mirror, as I was saying, one's experiences, but also being a window to the other. And um, you've seen in after a quick drag uh, in, the, in the past, I'm sure, Chair Van Bremer, right? You know, nothing gets more attention that a loud um, drag, um, you know, performer, just really making sure that, uh, you know, um, the same freedom in which they perform is conveyed to those that are seeing them. And, and just um, being able to um, have somebody that has been designated by uh, the local government and just given that platform, I think it will be incredibly helpful to support um, the uh, nightlife. And, and again, um, it's not only about night, nightlife, it's about the art form itself. Yeah, I think one of the most exciting things for, for me is, is the ability to amplify and, and elevate um, uh, the art form and um, the community of, of people who are, who are experts uh, and, uh, and real craftspersons in this, uh, in this arena. And uh, I know Marty and others um, have uh, done incredible work. And, and I think this would be uh, uh, transformational really in, in, in putting the city of New York, uh, putting a, a, its own stamp, right? And saying, this is really important. This really matters. Um, and uh, it, it matters so much that we're going to actually designate a drag laureate for the city of New York. And one of the most joyful moments, at least for me, uh, in the calendar of the city of New York is the Friday before the Pride Parade, um, the Drag March, in which, again, you see so much happiness, so much freedom, so much, um, you know, um, community that uh, I can't imagine if we, if we expand that um, year long by having this laureate uh, individual um, sort of promoting um, our community, our businesses, and our culture. Yeah, we we all certainly need a little more joy uh, in in our lives, but also the the you know the the movement oriented uh, art form that that drag is in so many ways uh, would be would be what actually uh, increases uh, space uh, for people to simply be right. Um, uh, however it is they come to this space and, and identify and live within it, right? Um, this position has that ability to help do that for so many people. Um, and uh, uh, appreciate that. I know you, you uh, are not here to speak to the other two pieces of legislation because um, they don't fall particularly within uh, the Department of Cultural Affairs realm. Um, uh, so we'll have to... Uh, um, get your thoughts on those, uh, but uh, uh, if you wanted to say anything about the trans uh, resolutions, um, yeah, certainly feel free to, but uh, I know. I mean, personally, I can I support 100%, you know, the resolution as a member of the LGBTQ community and a cisgender man and an ally of the uh, trans community. Um, I will have to leave uh, that the administration to uh, speak, you know, officially um, on the two other resolutions. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, uh, appreciate your um, your being here and uh, just you being you. Um, and uh, it would have been fun to see you in drag for this uh, hearing, but uh, we we still have a couple more to go. So uh, uh, maybe both of us uh, can show up. Um, but uh, Marty, <laughs> Marty would have a lot of work to do uh, to get uh, uh, you and I into a, a proper uh, situation where we could proudly represent. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but uh, but thank you. Um, and speaking of which, I know that we have uh, uh, an incredible uh, lineup of folks who would like to speak to uh, the the bills and resolutions. And I'll ask our council to uh, invite the public to testify now. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Chair Van Bramer. Uh, before we move to public testimony, I just want to make sure that we're uh, not bypassing any members of the council who may want to ask any questions. Uh, I don't see any hands raised, but wanted to provide that opportunity to them before moving forward. Okay, seeing no council members waiting to ask questions, we will move on to the public panel. Uh, now that we've concluded the administration's testimony, uh, for members of the public, please note that I will call up individuals and panels. Council members who have questions for you will use the Zoom raise hand function, and you will be called on after everyone in the panel has completed their testimony. Uh, council members who have questions for a particular panelist, as I said, will use the Zoom raise hand function. Panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant of Arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting a timer. All testimony will be limited to two minutes and please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Our panel today is Marty Cummings, followed by Olive Daddy, Daddy Tiffany Monroe, and apologies if I mispronounced anyone's name. Uh, Marty Cummings, if you're ready, you can wait for the council to put the sergeant to call the clock and you can begin your testimony. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Marty Cummings and my pronouns are they, them, theirs, and I strongly support intro um, uh, 2203, a drag laureate uh, role in our city would, uh, would validate the art form of drag. Drag is an art form that has no box to hold it in. It is for all genders, sexual orientations, races, identities, economic backgrounds, religious backgrounds. Drag is for everyone. And it's an art form that not only supports so many businesses, but it's an art form that helps to teach and educate people. I had the great honor of uh, working with um, Drag Queen Story Hour, which I know the city council is very familiar with, and uh, joined a TED Talk um, several years ago about the importance of using drag to spread joy, especially to our young people, so they feel seen, heard, that they feel accepted. Drag is not some fringe, silly art form. It is a real way for people to express themselves through music, theater, dance, comedy, the list goes on and on. And especially as we come out of the pandemic, a drag laureate uh, would be someone who can help our businesses get back on their feet, help our artists find ways to support themselves and their loved ones. I think it's a crucial program and it's not one that is new or unique. West Hollywood just implemented it. San Francisco is looking into it, but we as the largest city in the country can set the bar, implement uh, 2203, have this program, and then show other cities how you can incorporate drag into uh, city government. Um, and I'm proud to support this bill and uh, we'll, We'll fight tooth and nail to get it. So thank you for, for having me. Thank you, Marty. And you perfectly met your mark as uh, you always do. Um, literally two minutes to the I was second. watching the clock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so, you know, we, we, we talked a little bit about businesses and small businesses and how uh, this program uh, might help. Uh, and I think it would. But as you know, because uh, I, I, I've seen you post recently about, I think you posted how many performances uh, you've, you've done in your career um, uh, as you were traveling, I, I, I think, the country recently. And, you know, it made me think that, you know, this, this program could also help solidify in people's minds that, that drag is an art form and drag performers are artists who are working artists who need to be paid uh, for uh, their art. And, and so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's going to help small businesses for sure, uh, because drag performances often bring people in and, and are, are something that, that uh, you know, packs the house. Um, but, but speak a little bit about 
it as as something that respects drag artists and performers and 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 could actually make sure that folks are are getting paid and getting paid um, well uh, for the art form. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, a really important point. And, you know, I, uh, several years ago, was appointed by um, the speaker to serve on the Nightlife Council, Advisory Council. And one of the things that we did was really work to ensure um, uh, that the proposals we were sending to city council highlight artists like drag artists who experience wage theft, who experience um, lack of, of resources, access to uh, health care, access to paid time off and paid sick leave. But these are workers who show up day in and day out, providing huge revenue streams for their businesses. And we're seeing now it's not just queer spaces that are hiring drag artists. We, it runs the whole gamut because people have caught on to drag makes them uh, money. So we need to make sure that those drag artists are being paid a true livable wage, that they have access to services um, uh, that, that other workers have. And I think having a drag laureate would be somebody who can really talk to businesses along with our city government to advocate for workers the same way we're, work, we're advocating for other gig workers across the city. Our nightlife workers and drag um, artists are folks who really need access um, to that. And, and, you know, we're out there doing, you know, our jokes and our kicks and our splits and, and making people entertain, but we need to make sure that we're provided for as well. And I think this is a, a crucial program that, that can be that kind of link to the businesses to really sit down to the table and talk about um, how we're helping your business. You now you help us as artists. Yeah, I, I, I um, recently did a Drag Queen Story Hour program with uh, Bella Noche, I who <laughs> I, I love, uh, I've done several events with, with Bella and, um, uh, and we were on Skillen Avenue in Sunnyside and Bella had just finished and the kids were all, uh, had ar already taken their photos and everyone was happy and it was just a glorious thing. And, uh, and I, I turned to Bella and I said, uh, uh, how are you getting home? Like, are you, are you good? Like, and, um, and Bella said, girl, I got to go to work. I got another gig right after this, right? Because this is not the end of my day. I am. I am going to do some more more shows and more gigs, uh, and it just reminds you how uh, how hard uh, folks are working and how many gigs they might be doing on a particular day. Um, and it's just incredibly important for us to to respect that. Yeah, well, I, I I'll end with this. You know, drag artists, DJs, go go dancers, whatever the nightlife gamut is, we don't have a union that represents us. We advocate for ourselves. And so it's really, really crucial that our city government uh, has someone who, now I, 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 I love the Office of Nightlife, I love the advisory board, I love the work that, that's being done around that, but we really need to make sure that the gig workers who are kind of considered on the fringe are brought to the table so they're provided for. Because a lot of drag artists, I have so many friends uh, who, through their drag are not only paying their own bills, but sending money home to their families, sending money home to their loved ones to make sure that they're taken care of. And uh, we rely heavily, not just on the often small booking fee that's provided, but through a tipped culture. And so it's really, really imperative. Um, I believe that the Drag Laureate program not only spread goodwill and cheer throughout the city and joy, but really be a role that can advocate for these workers who are workers and artists. Their art is their, their work. Um, uh, and I'm just, I'm, I'm super proud that our city is even having this discussion. Thank you, uh, Marty. Appreciate obviously your contributions in so many ways and so many spaces, but uh, especially being here today uh, as an advocate. And I'll hand it back over to our moderator to call on the next panelist. Thank you so much, Marty Cummings, for your testimony. Uh, next, we'll be hearing from all of Daddy, and you may begin delivering your testimony once the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you. Start in time. Thank you. Um, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to give testimony in support of Resolution 1487. Um, my name is Olive Dottie. I use the pronouns they and them, and I'm here to testify on behalf of myself 
and also Translatinx Network, um, which is a community-based organization in District 3 in Chelsea, where we serve the transgender, gender nonconforming, otherwise LGBTQ and immigrant communities of the city. Um, speaking on behalf of Translatinx Network, we hope that 1487 is passed because we want to see more people in the city celebrating and cherishing trans lives, especially the lives of Black and Latina transgender women who have always and continue to lead the fight for our rights to live safely and authentically in this city. Um, for the past 10 years, Translatinx Network has held a gathering every November to honor the lives of our siblings who have been taken away from us. Um, and another one every March to honor the brilliance and of our identities and our community. Um, we'll be gathering again next month on November 19th uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. at St. Bart's Church in Midtown East, if anyone would like to attend and see um, exactly what we're talking about in this resolution. Um, and speaking personally as a queer and transgender person, I would not have the civil rights, the language and vision for my sense of self or the community I have today without the unrelenting work of Black and Latinx trans activists, artists, and organizers, such as many of the people that I'm really lucky to work with. Um, however, when I am able to exercise the rights that we have gained, it's often the racial privilege that I have as a white person that is opening the door first. Um, and many Black and Latina women who have always led this fight um, are still systematically disenfranchised and murdered in all the ways that this resolution talks about. Um, and again, with visibility, when media comes out about us, um, it many times is portraying white transmasculine people who look like me. Um, so we need more visibility for Black and Latino women. I'm expired. Did you want to finish up, Olive? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so all of that just to say, we hope that this resolution is passed um, to celebrate the people who are here and to remember the people that we've lost. Um, but we both hope that me and Translat Next Network um, are hoping that with the passage of this resolution, um, the city makes an effort to specifically resource and amplify Black and Latinx trans leaders, um, sort of in line with all of the work that they've done. Thank you um, uh, very much uh, for your testimony, for your uh, for your work, um, and and for being here today. Uh, needless to say, I, I support uh, the resolution. Um, but um, uh, as you point out, the resolution is not uh, the end. Um, it is it is a moment. Uh, it is important. Um, but uh, what has to follow? through is the, the, the resources and the actual um, commitment on the part of the city of New York uh, to do all the things that we know it must do. Um, so maybe you can uh, uh, speak to uh, why it's important to pass the resolution because the resolution itself is, it doesn't provide funding, right? It doesn't uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, do uh, some of the things that uh, uh, pieces of, of legislation that are bills do, but uh, I believe this is very important. I, I believe you believe this is very important, but maybe you can speak to why it is so important to pass the resolution. Sure. Um, so in order like for us to have these days recognized in the city um, as citywide holidays or just days that we are all aware of, um, it one sort of brings just more attention to these conversations. Um, it's two somewhat separate conversations, but that are very related to each other. So we need more attention towards the way that our communities are experiencing violence. Um, but we also need more attention to the ways in which that is not our only narrative and we are whole people um, and we deserve to be seen that way and celebrated. Um, so it's important to pass this resolution because we want more people just to know that like we're here um, and like we belong to this city. The city is our home. Um, we want to be recognized by this city and we want, you know, people to join to join us, like to join our community in, in celebration um, in honoring our lives. Uh, and we want to create as many opportunities as possible for that to happen. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Olive, and obviously, um, uh, I'm, I'm also 
gay man. I'm a, a cis gender white gay man. Um, uh, so I too share uh, some of those privileges that you spoke about, um, unearned as they may be. Uh, but I also remember as a as a kid um, watching the movie Dog Day Afternoon, which is an old reference, perhaps. But uh, uh, but I remember watching that movie as a little boy um, and seeing the uh, uh, unflattering and tragic representation uh, of queer people and uh, internalized that even at that very young age knowing that that's who I was, uh, but uh, but knowing that that's not what I wanted to be because they were portraying uh, the queer people in that film in such an unflattering and tragic way. Um, yep, absolutely. Um, I, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, and I, I guess part of what you're speaking to is we we should be the people who are presenting our own image. I don't want to see any more representations of trans people by people who hate us. Um, I want to see trans people portrayed and represented by our community and by our allies and people who love us and want us to thrive. Yeah, same. Thank you very much, uh, Olive, for being here. Uh, and I'll turn it over to the moderator for our next panelist. Thank you so much for your testimony, Olive. Our final panelist is Tiffany Monroe. Uh, Tiffany, you may begin delivering your testimony once the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you. Starting time. Thank you so much, everyone, for allowing me to come here and testify under Resolution 1487. Um, my name is Tiffany Jade Monroe. I am a trans justice coordinator for the Caribbean Equality Project, a Queens-based community organization that empowers, advocates for, and represents black and brown, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, gender non-confirming, and queer Caribbean immigrants in New York City. I am to testify on the importance of recognizing November 20th annually as Transgender Day of Remembrance and March 31st annually as Transgender Day of Visibility in the city of New York. At the Caribbean Equality Project, we are thrilled that the city wants to recognize these two annual community-focused days centered on honoring and celebrating transgender and gender expansive people. However, we wish to acknowledge the significance of why trans activists first created these days. There is an epidemic of anti-transgender violence and erasure in New York City and across the country that disproportionately impacts Black trans women and trans women of color, particularly immigrants, asylum seekers, sex workers, and refugees. Since 1999 and prior years, Black and brown people of trans experience have been murdered in record and traumatizing numbers. The list of my killed trans siblings grows longer and longer year by year with no end in sight to transphobic related violence. These senseless and brutal killings must stop. I say this to you as a scared black trans woman who fears her name will one day be added to a say their names list. The transgender community is systematically ignored, erased and forgotten about by our families, communities and government. These days are important and we need it due to the staggering amounts of violence inflicted on my community. Time expired. Thank you. Uh, feel free to finish, uh, Tiffany. Anything oh. else? Keep going. Yes. Yes. Uh, sorry. New York City should undoubtedly recognize Transgender Day of Remembrance and Transgender Day of Visibility. But I also want to remind our elected officials that the city has tremendous power and life-saving resources to offer trans people. If New York City wants trans people to be visible, it needs to put us first in its efforts to create a safer and healthier city. Since New York City wants to recognize Transgender Day of Remembrance, a day dedicated to mourning and remembering my murdered trans siblings, the city should also invest more money into affordable housing to keep black and brown trans people safe. We deserve citywide recognition and more robust laws to end workplace discrimination, access to affirming healthcare options and immigration services to protect undocumented transgender people and asylum seekers. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, 
Tiffany for that powerful, powerful uh, testimony. And I, I could see uh, Marty Olive and Gonzalo uh, uh, shaking their heads uh, 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 as I, I was. Um, and first of all, let me just say uh, the, the Caribbean Equality Project is one of my favorite uh, organizations. Absolutely love, love, love the work uh, being done uh, there and uh, have been out uh, uh, to Ozone Park and other parts of Queens um, with uh, um, the Caribbean Equality Project, um, just doing great work in Queens and throughout the city. Um, and, you know, I, I was um, you know, devastated uh, to hear you talk about um, the fear um, uh, of being uh, added to that list, uh, which is already far too long, of uh, 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 in particular black and brown uh, uh, trans folks uh, who've been uh, uh, killed. And the, the truth is, as uh, Olive and I spoke a little bit about earlier, uh, this is important. We need to pass these, this resolution, but it is just the beginning. It is just the beginning. Uh, uh, it, it, it alone does not make everyone safe. Uh, it alone doesn't provide all of those resources uh, that we know are needed, uh, but it is, it is uh, the least we could do in so many ways, right? The least we could do is pass uh, this resolution. So uh, grateful for your courage uh, and uh, your emotional testimony. Uh, here today, uh, which is a reminder to all of us uh, that we have so much more to do, um, so much more to do. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Tiffany? Um, I just wanna thank you guys so much for this opportunity. Um, you know, I, I came to this country as a gay man. Uh, I came all the way from Guyana, South America and, you know, coming to the United States made me um, be my, beautiful self, the person that I am, because in the Caribbean, you know, the discrimination is on the next level. And I could not have been a transgender woman there. And coming here and being with the Caribbean Equality Project has allowed me to um, experience new stuff, be who I am. And um, it, it is tough since, you know, I'm undocumented and um, I'm still awaiting the government to uh, sort that stuff out because I'm an asylum seeker. And, you know, I live with my transphobic aunt who is a terrible person, but I just wanted to be here and be safe and no mind the conditions that I am in. I, I still feel that sense of that safe space. Mm. Uh, thank you for, for uh, sharing uh, that, Tiffany. And uh, thank you for reminding all of us um, of why we're here in government and what we must do while we're in positions of, of any power. And I know that uh, Commissioner Casals uh, uh, feels that, that uh, obligation and responsibility as well. Um, so thank you very much again, uh, Tiffany, for your courage. Uh, I'm told that Council Member Francisco Moya has joined us and that Council Member Diaz um, would like to um, speak and ask a question. Councilmember Diaz. Yep, we have to unmute you. There Am you I go. muted now? Okay. No, you're good. We can hear you now. Just wanted to commend the panelists for sharing your stories. Putting yourself out there is, is, a, is a big deal. You know, and, and just know that Darmy Diaz, when she leaves the council, will continue to support your agenda. And Darmy Diaz, the chair, of women, gender, and equity definitely stands stands with you. So Tiffany, you, you mentioned housing. Housing is a human right. And I will also continue to advocate for housing because again, it, it's a human right. And, and the beginning of our conversation, a more silly note, we were talking about the chair and the commissioner coming in dressed in drag. I, I welcome, <laughs> I wanna see <laughs> our performances. I'd be a liar and not be generous and say that I've attended many drag shows and I take my friends. I've had a blast. Thank you for your service because it's brought much cheer to me and many of my friends. So I, I welcome to be invited to a few shows as well. Yes. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Council Member this. Diaz. Um, uh, and uh, it, it is very meaningful to have uh, other council members uh, indeed recognizing uh, the courage uh, and um, the incredible bravery of our panelists um, to, to speak their truth and uh, share their stories. No, absolutely. I, as a domestic violence survivor, I know it hurts when you have to open yourself up and relive every, every occurrence. So thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Diaz. I recognize Council Member Moya, correct? Uh, are there any other uh, council members that we need to recognize? Madam Moderator? At this point, we have concluded, concluded public testimony, Chair Van Bramer. However, if we've inadvertently missed anyone, either council member or panelist who we didn't get to, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on you the, in the order that your hand is raised. Uh, seeing no one else, I would like to note the written testimony, which will be reviewed in full by the committee staff, may be submitted to the record up to 72 hours after the close of this hearing by emailing it to testimony at council.newyorkcity.gov. And Chair Van Bramer, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing, so back to you to close. Thank you very much uh, to uh, uh, all the uh, team members who had a hand in putting together this hearing, including our uh, sergeants at arms and a special, special thanks again to Marty, Olive and Tiffany um, for being here today and being such incredible people and advocates and activists and artists. So thank you. And with that, this hearing is concluded.